air conditioned style. <laughs> Love that sunny weather, but man, it's nice to be in here for a change. So good to see you all this morning. If you're watching online, it's good to have you with us too. Uh, I don't know which camera to look at. Anyway, it's one of those. Um, so as we start this morning, we're going to sing uh, Faithful Now, which has been our anthem for this series. Uh, one last time this morning, so I'd ask you to stand if you're able to. Just stand and join us as I open us in prayer, and then we'll go right into that song. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for just all the ways that you bless us, the ways that you take care of us. God, you are so faithful in all circumstances, God. We know that we can uh, just rely on you. You're our rock and our strength. We thank you and we praise you for that. Be with us this morning. May your spirit just fill this place. Rest on us this morning as we worship. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 him for his faithfulness. Take a moment to say hello to the people around you, and we will keep moving here.
those Pharisees, they started throwing stones. Before he died, he raised his eyes and saw Jesus on the throne. Say you can bury the workman, but the work will go on. And you can silence the voices, but you can't stop the song. When the Spirit's moving, His will will be done. Cause you can bury the workman, but the work will go on. Now James was sent to heaven at the edge of Herod's sword. And Peter, he was crucified like his beloved Lord. The Roman Colosseum, the lions and the fire. The gates of hell did not prevail. They fanned those flames higher. Cause you can bury the workman, but the work will go on. And you can silence the voices, but you can't stop the song. When the spirit's moving, his will will be done. And you can bury the workman, but the work will They thought that it was over, that his name would fade away. But Jesus wasn't listening, no. He rose to life again. Cause God is not persuaded by the arrogance of me. a great song and a great way to start our last message in this series uh, called 180 and we're going to unpack some of what was in that story of that song in just a few minutes but right now it's time for the kids to be dismissed to their church so the leaders are over here y'all can meet them over there and they will go do their thing and that would be good okay all right have fun kids you know one of the things that the kids get to celebrate when they go together is community they get to celebrate friendships they get to celebrate growing up together. We were just talking about that the other day, how some kids from KCC have grown up together and now they're young adults, and it's fun to see that this is where it started. Community relationships are one of those key important things. Those are one of the values we have here, and that's some of the reason we do uh, a lot of this stuff that we do. So we've got a couple opportunities for you to get involved in relationships and community, and we want to encourage you to do that. First of all, next week, next week after the service, we're going to have a cookout. We're going to have pig's head barbecue. Now, I don't know how many times you ever thought about celebrating a pig's head. I mean, it's one of those things. Barbecue has weird names, boar's head, pig's head, etc. but we love it. Pig's head barbecue is going to uh, feed us, and we're going to have mac and cheese and cornbread and everything, and you don't have to do anything. You just have to show up and be here, and why do we do that? Because it gives you an opportunity to get to know some other KC Sears and enjoy fellowship. That's why we're doing it right after next Sunday's service, so that's an important thing. We also have a life group series coming up. It's going to start on September 12th, Sunday, September 12th, and this series is called Lit. Lit, start developing an on-fire relationship with God. We want your relationship to God, with God to be lit. We don't just want to settle for, oh, 
I have my religion. I have my Sunday tradition. No, that's not what this is about. And we're going to talk about that today, too. So we really want to encourage you to do that. This would be a great series to invite some friends to, especially friends who are maybe new to the faith or have been looking. Maybe they haven't been looking. Maybe they've never thought about coming to church. Just invite them to this series because the whole point of the series is no matter where you're at, there are steps forward that you can take and you can grow in your faith. And so hopefully every one of us will have something that connects in that series and will help us go further in their faith. So uh, we want to encourage you to start that. A great opportunity to invite friends. There is a sign-up sheet if you're interested in more information out on the, the table out there just as you leave the lobby. If you're here online, first of all, hello. And you can definitely write, I'm interested in Life Group or, or Lit Series or something like that in the comments. Also, we want to get to know all of you. And so if you are new here today, there are some connect cards that are out on that stone table out in the lobby. We'd love for you to just sign them, fill it out, and just leave it there. I'll collect them. I'll get a hold of you this week. I'd love to have a conversation about what, you know, your background, what brought you here, and that kind of thing. And if you're new online, just type in I'm new in the chat. And again, we'll get a hold of you this week so that you can, you can get to know uh, us and we can get to know you. So, uh, also, this is the time if you want to give online, you can do it either virtually, even like right now, a lot of you have it already set up, or there is a little box in the back if you want to do old school, you want to put a check in the box or something like that, you can do that too, so please make sure you do that, and we are thankful that so many people have done that uh, throughout the, this whole pandemic time. You guys have been faithful, and God has used you in a powerful way, so thank you. I'm going to pray, and we will get started in the message portion. Lord, thank you for the things we've already sung about today. I mean, the content of the songs we've already sung has been good and important. And Father, we thank you for this whole 180 series that you've shown us that not only did you do stuff in history, you can do stuff in our lives if we let you, if we open up. And so, Lord, that's what we want to do today. We want you to glorify yourself through us. We thank you, Lord, that you've been so faithful to us in so many ways. Uh, throughout this last year and a half, but even more, much more than that. And we thank you and we praise you and we give you all the glory for everything that's gone on in our lives. And we pray that you would help us to cooperate with you even more so that you can change us even more. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. By the way, we're going to have communion today. So if you are home uh, and online, you might want to get stuff ready for communion so we can be prepared to do that. So today we're finishing our series on the 180, right? We've talked about how God can do a 180 in your life, how he will take your circumstances, your difficulties, your failures. He can take them and turn them around and use them for a strength, for victory, for growth, all of that. He has the ability to do that when you and I don't have the natural ability to do that. And, and that's an important thing. That's important that we trust him to do that, that we turn it over to him, and that we have confidence that he has the strength, the, the passion, the ability to change us and to change our circumstances. We, we saw it in, in Moses' life. We saw it in Daniel and his three friends' life. Last week, we talked about Peter and his life and how God changed him. And today, we're going to talk about one more guy in the New Testament. Uh, but before we do that, I, I have to confess to you that I have... Maybe it's not a fear. I have a, a concern. I have a concern that a lot of times, no matter how relevant we try to make the language about these stories seem, we think of them as stories. We think of them as things in the past. So, yeah, it's a nice story. It was a very inspiring story about Daniel and his three friends. It's very inspiring. Next time I'm thrown into a fiery furnace, I'll remember that, right? I mean, that's what we tend to put it in the back of, well, yeah, I'll keep this in mind for next time I'm going through a crisis or next time I'm really challenged in my faith or to stand up. And so we put it in the back of our minds almost like a file cabinet and we forget where we put it oftentimes. We don't even think about it anymore. The whole point of this series is not to do that. The whole point of this series is that God wants to do a 180 in your life right now. And here's my concern. I think a lot of us don't think we need a 180. I'm good. My, my life is fine. My finances are pretty good. My family is pretty healthy. My, my marriage is, is okay. Uh, my, you know, my faith is, is strong. I mean, I, I believe in God. I go to church most Sundays. I, I, I pray sometimes. I mean, things are fine. I don't need a 180. And a lot of times we are so content in our faith and in our relationship with God the way it is that we never stop to ask him, Lord, what do you think? 
Do you want to do a 180 in me, Lord? Do you want to turn something over in my life? Do you want to change something in my life? I guarantee you this. He does. No matter who you are, no matter what your background, no matter what you've grown, I guarantee you that God wants to grow you more and change you more and show up in your life more. And so as we talk about this last person, don't allow it to be relegated to sort of ancient history, that file cabinet in the back of your mind. Ask God right now, just through the Holy Spirit, ask God, Lord, is there an area you want to turn over in my life? Is there an area you want to change in my life? I'm pretty sure there is. And we're just sometimes oblivious. We're sort of plugging our ears going through it. So today we're going to talk about one more guy who God did a 180. And it's a pretty amazing 180. His name is Paul in the New Testament. He wrote a lot of the New Testament. If you think, if you're, think of the scripture, think of the Old Testament as a lot of things that set the groundwork and predicted the coming of a Messiah. The New Testament is the Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that talk all about the life and teachings of Jesus and how he was the coming Messiah. And the rest of the New Testament is sort of unpacking that and reacting to that and sort of saying, okay, because he was who he is, because he is who he is, what does that mean for us? And so Paul wrote a lot of those letters, but it didn't start out that way. Paul started out on the other side and changed. God did a 180 in Paul's life. So you got you to think of, okay, now Jesus has ascended to heaven. Peter has started to share the gospel. There are more people coming to faith. There's miracles being done. This is all centered around Jerusalem and the temple right now. Because remember, the people who grew up or who listened to Jesus, who hung out with Jesus, were all Jews. Jesus was a Jew. They, they all grew up in the same uh, area. They all learned the same things. They had the same faith. They had the same traditions. And, and they went to the temple. That was the center of their worship. And so even though these people now were Christians, they went to, it was a temple-centered kind of Christianity. It was, a, it was an unpacking of the Old Testament in the New Testament kind. They were going to the temple to say, hey guys, good news. We found the Savior. All of this stuff we've learned all growing up and looking forward to the Savior. He's come. He's here. He's, it's Jesus of Nazareth. He's the risen Savior. And so now that was the difference. They were still going to the temple. They were still hanging out in Jerusalem. And increasingly they were making people uncomfortable. Because there were people, there were people who were believing what they taught. And they were coming to faith. And that's good from a Christian standpoint, but from a Jewish standpoint, that wasn't good at all. And they did not like it at all. And so they realized, we gotta put these people down. We gotta get rid of this movement. This Jesus thing is bubbling up and it's starting to spill over and we can't allow it. We have to stop it. And so they started persecuting the church. And when I say persecution in America, we kind of think of you know, people giving us grief. Or we think of maybe, maybe we lose a friend because we said the wrong thing about Jesus or something like that. We're too out there. And so we kind of we keep it to ourselves. That's persecution when things don't go exactly the way I want. Well, that's not persecution. That may be something else. That may not be comfortable. That's not persecution. The persecution they went through was real persecution. We see it starting in Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, we're introduced to a man named Stephen. Stephen is... He's, he's just a deacon in Jerusalem. We just sang about it. Stephen was a deacon in Jerusalem. He was, he was a spirit-filled man who God worked through in powerful ways. And he was, a, he was a powerful one that was bringing people to faith in Christ. And so they targeted Stephen. And so they raised up false witnesses against him. They brought him in for trial, and they put him on trial. And so Acts chapter 6 and 7 are basically Stephen talking to this council. The ones who had put Jesus to death, Stephen is in their, their presence. And he's telling them, look, this is everything we've learned, guys. This is all the, the Old Testament history. He's in agreement with them. Again, he's a, Jew, he's a fellow Jew. But now when they get to the point about the Messiah, Jesus, he's come. This is the good news. He's come. Everything we've hoped for has now been fulfilled. And he turns to them and he says, you, he talks to the Pharisees, their leaders, you are a stiff-necked and stubborn people. And now they start to respond because they would remember it. I don't know if you remember Three weeks ago, we talked about Moses, and Moses, God told Moses, okay, it's time. You go into the promised land, but I'm not going with you because you are a stiff-necked and stubborn people, and I might kill you along, along the way, if you remember that. Well, so they remembered that language, and Stephen now says that to them, and so how do they react? They don't react well. They, 
They, it says in uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 57, they put their hands over their ears, they began shouting, they rushed at him, they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him to death. His accusers took off their coats and laid them at the feet of a young man named Saul. Make note of that name. As they stoned him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He fell to his knees shouting, Lord, don't charge this, them with this sin. And with that, he died. Chapter 8, verse 1, Saul was one of the witnesses, and he agreed completely with the killing of Stephen. So this is the beginning of persecution. Stephen was the first martyr for the faith. It's the only thing he was guilty of was his faith. He was killed. He was stoned to death for his faith by Jews who believed in the coming of the Messiah but didn't believe Jesus was that Messiah. And so that just begins a wave of persecution. It continues. A great wave of persecution began that day, sweeping over the church in Jerusalem. And all the believers except the apostles were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And some devout men came and buried Stephen along with great mourning. But Saul was going everywhere to destroy the church. He went from house to house, dragging out both men and women and throwing the, to throw them into prison. So this is Saul's passion at this point. He is a Pharisee. A very educated man, a very learned man in the law and all of the things about it. He knows several different languages. He's a very intelligent dude, very influential guy. And his passion, his goal is to wipe out this Jesus movement, to wipe it out completely. So he's going house to house, gathering men and women, pulling them out of their houses, just like you see on the news today, just like we hear about today. That was happening then, and Saul was the leader of it. And so he goes, and he's pursuing people to to throw them in jail and wipe out this Jesus movement. He does not want the name of Jesus to be known anywhere. So he, he, that's his goal in life. So he continues, but something changes in Saul's life. Chapter 9, verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was uttering threats and with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. He went to the high priest. He requested letters addressing the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation with the arrest of any followers of the way. That's what they called it, the way he found there. And he wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. So as he went on the way, he went to Damascus, and he's trying to persecute people and find people who are followers of Jesus. Something happens. It says, as he was approaching Damascus on the mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul answered. And the voice replied back, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men with Saul stood speechless. They heard the sound of someone's voice, but they saw no one. Saul picked himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. So his companions had to lead him by hand into Damascus. He remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. So here is Saul, literally knocked off his high horse by Jesus, okay? And he's blind all of a sudden. And so now he goes into Damascus. His goal is to wipe out the way, to wipe out, persecute, or wipe out followers of Jesus and persecute them and chain them up and, and drag them out. That's his goal. But now he's been knocked off his horse by this Jesus whom he's been persecuting. And now he's got to sit there and think about it for three days. So I wonder, we're not told, I'm just wondering, what was he thinking in those three days? He wasn't eating or drinking or anything. I've got to assume, here's an intelligent Pharisee. This man is a learned person in the law, in the Old Testament law. I've got to assume he's thinking, where did I go wrong? I mean, this Jesus who I thought was dead is clearly alive. He's the one who knocked me off my horse. He's the one who appeared to me. He's the one who spoke to me. He's the one who made me blind. Where did I go wrong? And he's probably putting together all of the Old Testament stuff that he had learned and realizing Jesus is the fulfillment of that. For three days, he sits there and thinks about this stuff, and he thinks about Isaiah 53, and he thinks about Ezekiel 36, and he thinks about Jeremiah 31, and he thinks about how this is that new movement. This is the, the promise that we've been having. And he puts it all together, I'm sure, in those three days. And then a man named Ananias in that town is told to go to talk to him and go uh, lead him to, to Jesus. But Ananias is reluctant because he knows who, who Saul is. But God says to Ananias in verse 15, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings as well as to the people of Israel, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And so Ananias goes to him, and he says to him, Brother Saul, the Lord, uh, 
the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road sent me so that you might be, regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And instantly something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight and then he got up and was baptized and afterward he ate some food and regained his strength. So suddenly Saul now sees again. He's literally given his sight again and now, but now he's baptized in Jesus' name. The one who was persecuting the church is now a follower. The one who is trying to wipe out the name of Jesus now is baptized in Jesus' name. But it doesn't stop there. Saul stayed a few days with the believers in Damascus, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues, saying he is indeed the Son of God. So this is why I'm thinking this is what he was doing in the three days of silence. He's putting it all together. Now he knows all who heard him were amazed. Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem? And didn't he come here to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priests? And now he's a proponent of this. Now he's an evangelist for Jesus. That's an amazing, you talk about 180. This is a 180 in Saul's life. And it's so much a 180. He, he was changed. He was born again through the Holy Spirit. He's now a different man. And so that's part of the reason he changes his name from Saul to Paul. And Paul is the guy who wrote most of the New Testament letters. Paul is so much in, you know, impacted by the grace of God that that becomes one of the prominent things he writes about and one of the prominent understandings we have of God now is through Paul's understanding of grace. God's grace that reached down and saved him even when he was persecuting the church. And he never got over that. And you and I should never get over the fact that God, in his grace, reached down and saved us. That's a pretty amazing, amazing 180. But again, it doesn't stop there. All of a sudden, Paul now is an advocate of Christ. He's a very effective evangelist. He goes around city to city, goes first to the synagogue to reach out to the Jews, the fellow Jews. He wants to reach them and say, we found him. He's here. But then when they reject him, he goes to the Gentiles. And so the message starts to spread. And he go, it goes all over the place because God is now bringing in new people from new areas. And Saul, Paul, is the main spokesperson. And so... They can't have that. The Pharisees can't allow that. And so they begin to persecute and chase down Paul. So the persecutor becomes the persecuted. The hunter becomes the hunted. And that's how it went. And that's how the rest of his life would go. And he was okay with that. He embraced that. It's a pretty amazing thing. He goes on in, in 2 Corinthians 11. We won't turn there, but you can write that down. 2 Corinthians 11, he talks about, he takes several verses to talk about all the ways he was persecuted. So he was whipped, he was caned, he was flogged, he was beaten, he was stoned, he was threatened with death all the time, he was shipwrecked. I mean, there were several things that happened only because he was doing the message, doing the work that God had called him to do only because he was one who was spreading the good news about Jesus. That's why he could have just been quiet and none of that would have happened. He could have just kept it to himself. Look, my faith is private. I'm just going to keep it to myself. And nobody would have known anything. Nobody would have persecuted him. He could have had an easy life. But he can't do that because God has changed him and God has called him and God has gifted him and God has put a, a, a burden on his life so that he wants to do this. And, and as a result, he is able to do to endure amazing things. Let me tell you about one story very quickly. Acts chapter 16. And it's actually we, in that, in that Faithful Now song that we've sung every week, it references this thing. Acts chapter 16. Paul and Silas go to Philippi, and they're taking the gospel to Philippi. And they go in there, and they go to the synagogue like they always do, and they start to share the good news about Jesus everywhere they go. And there's this girl in this town who is possessed by a demon, and he's a, kind of a fortune-telling demon. And so this girl follows him around all the time, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God. They're going to tell you how to be saved. And that's all she does constantly. Talk about irritating. She is telling the truth. Seriously, she's telling the truth, but she's not party to the truth. She knows the truth. Demons know the truth. They know who Jesus is, but they don't want to follow Jesus. And she was distracting attention from the message, from the legitimate truth, continuing to sort of be associated with it. So finally, Paul turns, turns to her and says, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And the demon comes out of her. And all of a sudden, she's no longer any use to her masters who were making money off of her. 
And now the town turns on them because now they're, they're coming. Paul and Silas are coming after their way of life. And they're starting to interfere with things the way they were done. And so they bring them to the magistrates. And the magistrates punish them. And they flog them. And they beat them bloody. And they send them to prison. And the jailer locks them in the inner part of the prison. The deepest, darkest part of the prison. He locks their feet in stocks. Hasn't addressed their wounds. There's no amnesty international people coming to them. They are on their own. They're in this deep, dark prison, beaten, still bleeding probably, hurting for sure, locked in stocks. It's a bleak day. Nobody, no matter how committed you are, would say that's a good day. (laughs) Nobody would want that kind of a day. I'm sure Paul didn't want that kind of a day, but he never backed down from that kind of day. So you got to picture this. They're in this deep, dark prison and now night falls. And they have, still haven't been fed, haven't been, their wounds haven't been addressed. They're maybe still bleeding. We don't know. Midnight happens. It's dark. It's dark anywhere at that time. There weren't lights all over the place. They're in a deep, dark prison in the inner part of it. It's pitch black. And how do they react? They, Lord, get us out of here. Lord, you know, do, help us, you know, make it better for us. Do they, is that what they, No. <laughs> Verse 25 of Acts Chapter 16 tells you how they reacted. About midnight, it says, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening. I don't know about you. I I like worship music. I like to sing. I like to pray. I'm not sure I'd be doing that at that point. I might be dejected. I might be crying out to God. I don't know what I would be doing. These guys were singing and praying. And it says the other, the other prisoners were listening. I've got to imagine when they first started, the other prisoners didn't react very kindly. They may have said, please quiet down in less polite language than that. But then at some point, you go, these, they've got to say something is up with these guys. We just saw them brought in, locked in stocks. They're beaten, they're bloody, and now they're singing songs to their God. There's got to be something different about these guys. Something's going on here. And so now they're just listening. And this prayer meeting and this worship time is continuing. And all of a sudden, the next verse says, suddenly there was a massive earthquake and the prison, the prison was shaken to its foundation and all the doors immediately flew open and the chains of every prisoner fell off. That's what the song talks about that we just sang. The jailer woke up to see the prison doors wide open. He assumed all the prisoners had escaped, so he drew his sword to kill himself because that is the punishment for letting prisoners escape. You die. So, but Paul shouted to him, stop, don't kill yourself. We're all still here. They're all still there. Paul and Silas are there, I get that. But all the other prisoners are still there too. What's up with that? The jailer called for lights and ran into the dungeon and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And then he brought them out and asked, sirs, what must we do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus with all, and you will be saved along with everyone in your household. And they shared the word of the Lord with them for all, and all who lived in the household. Even at that hour of the night, the jailer cared for them and washed their wounds. And then he and everyone in the household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his house and set a meal before them. And he, his, his entire household rejoiced because they all had believed in God. You talk about a 180. God did a 180 in Paul's life, and now God is doing a 180 in the prisoner's lives, in the jailer's life, in his family's life, and the church in Philippi now has a head start. Gets a shot in the arm, and that church continues for years and years and years, and that's part of how. Because God turned something that was incredibly difficult into something that was incredibly good. And so it leads us asking, okay, how does Paul endure all this? How on earth does this happen? How are we able to do Are we supposed to be able to endure all this? I think he endured all that because he walked with God. He endured all that because he loved the Lord. Because his life was all about the Lord. All about the gospel that he had now come to understand. And he wasn't going to be quiet about that. And so he anticipated persecution. It didn't stop him. It didn't shut him up. In fact, he wrote in 2 Timothy 3, 12. This is his last letter he writes on earth before, by the way, he goes to the emperor Nero and is martyred with his head cut off. Before that, he writes this letter. And one of the things he says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will, say will, will be persecuted. Everyone 
who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So that leads me wondering, have I been persecuted recently at all? If not, why not? And I think maybe part of the reason is because we're pretty, we're pretty soft in the American church. We kind of go along a lot in the American church. Paul was not soft. He was sold out completely because of what God had done in his life. And as a result, he was persecuted. So if you want to go through life comfortably and then just go to heaven when you're done, there's a way to do that. But I don't think that's what the Lord is after. So what does it mean for us? I think one of the things is this. You've got to learn the lesson. When, when you no longer fear death, then threats can't stop you. When you no longer fear death because you know the one who conquered death, then what power do threats have? None. They had boldness because they were that connected with the source of salvation. We have the same source of salvation. We have the same Holy Spirit inside of us who's given us new life in Christ through faith. Why do we not have that boldness? That's one of the things I'm praying for. So the great news of all this series is that God can do a 180 in your life, no matter what your circumstances, no matter what your difficulty, no matter what, who comes against you, no matter what challenges you've had, no matter what you grew up with, whatever impediments you have, doesn't matter. God has all the power necessary to do a 180 in your life, to do something powerful that only he can do. However, it'll only happen if you give it completely to him. A lot of times we tend to think of our lives in pie charts. And we think of the spiritual slice. And I give God the spiritual slice. It's an important slice. This Man, I'm glad I have the spiritual slice in my life. I'm glad my relationship with God is real. I'm glad I go to church. That's important to me. That's good. But God doesn't want a slice of your life. God wants the whole pie. God doesn't want a room in your house. He wants the house. And he deserves it. He earned it. He, he, we owe it to him. The whole thing. All in. Completely. Not dipping your toe. That's the kind of thing God wants from us. And that's what Paul gave. And that's why Paul was used so powerfully. The same Holy Spirit that was in Paul is in you and me if we're born again. The same one that was in Peter is in you and me. And God still wants to do powerful things in this world, especially as this world gets darker and more chaotic. He wants to sift, I think, the church in America, especially Maybe at KCC, he wants to sift it, to separate the wheat from the chaff, and to real, help us to realize, look, I'm calling you to be completely passionate for me. I'm calling you to come to me. I'm calling you to run to me when things go bad. Not, not to protest all this stuff. I mean, do what you do, but first find your identity in me. Find your strength and your protection and your passion in me. Be, be about him and his eternal kingdom, his glory. That's what he's calling us to do. That's why this 180 message in the series is important. Not so that, I mean, sure, it's important that he does things in my life and turns things around in my life. That is important, that's legitimate, and I want him to do that. But what's, I think, more important is he's calling us as the church to be completely about him, completely sold out to him and sharing him with everybody. That is is the challenge for us today. And so if you're not there yet, if you realize, look, just look at yourself and realize, okay, yep, that is, that's not me yet. God wants to do a 180 in you. He wants to turn you around. And he can. You just got to ask. So your assignment this week is simply that. Take five minutes every day. How many of you can do fi spare five minutes a day? Raise your hand right now. Five minutes a day. If, you, if you're not raising your hand, there's a problem. Because you can. Five minutes a day and pray specifically. Focus for five minutes. Don't let the squirrels distract you. Focus for five minutes. Lord, what do you want to do in my, what do you want to turn over in my life? What do you want to change? And then assignment number two is tell somebody that. Speak it out. Share it with your family. Share it with somebody. Share it with me. I don't care. Share it with somebody. Because when you start to think about that and pray about that and let God do that, then he will do a powerful thing in you and through you and he will use you and we will be the light that he's called us to be for his glory. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come.
And Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you that you've called us, Lord. We thank you that you have given us a calling. You want to use us. And Father, help us not to relegate this to history. Help us not to put this in the back of our mind and think we'll, about, we'll talk about it some other time. Help it, Lord, turn us over. Soften our hearts. Stir us up. Don't let us settle. We want to be passionate for you. We want to be used by you. We want our lives to glorify you. Do it this week, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. We have the privilege again of celebrating communion together and we remember why we do this we do this because this the thing we commemorate Jesus going to the cross changed everything that's the 180 that changed the world changed eternity for you and I and so we celebrate that because Jesus told us to remember and we are so forgetful that if we don't do something like this we'll just blow by it so let me just read a couple verses from from Luke 22 where it says he, uh, he took the cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. And he said, take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. And then he took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. He broke it in pieces and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. After supper, he took another cup of wine. He said, this cup is the cup of the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. So when we come and we do this, we take our little piece of bread and our cup of juice, we remember what Jesus did. We remember the fact that he poured out his blood. His blood is the new covenant. It's the standard that earns us forgiveness. His body that was beaten and bruised for us. It took our punishment. He willingly took our punishment. And so what I would invite you to do is to come forward and get one of these little containers. It has the juice and the cracker in it. Take it back to your seat and just pray. Just do, do what you can to thank God again, to remember again what Jesus has done for you, the change he's made, the 180 he's made possible in your life. And so as you do this, and then you can take it at your own pace, and so let me pray. Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus, your son, specifically to die for us, to die in our place, to pay for our sin, and then to rise again and offer us new life. Lord, we thank you. We could not have paid that debt. We owed it, but we could not have paid it. You did. Jesus, thank you for your willingness to do that. Holy Spirit, thank you for showing us that, for helping us to understand it. Now help us to appreciate it more than ever before. We pray for your glory in Jesus' name.
God is doing something, yeah, right now. He is up to something. He is up to something. God is doing something. song with you this morning. If you will stand up and join us. Hey! 
more time, sing that chorus with us. Because you picked me up, you turned me around, you placed my feet on solid ground. I thank the Master, yes, I thank the Savior. Because you healed my heart, you changed my name, forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the Master, I thank the Savior. Amen. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes. Amen. Yes. If that has been your experience, that he has healed your heart, changed your name, forever free, you're not the same. If that has been your experience, you need to represent that out in the world. You need to represent that in your families, in your Facebook, everywhere. You need to represent that when you're driving in traffic. You need to show that. That's what the world needs. That's the only thing they need. That's the main thing they need. And we are the representatives. We are his ambassadors. So this week, go. Let God continue to do a 180 in your life. Continue to turn it over. Continue to take what was bad and make it into something good that only he can do. And let, it do, and let him do it. And then share it with people. Share it and stop. Don't stop sharing it. Okay? Let me pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. And thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord, that changed us that turned us around, that did a 180. We pray that you would help us to cooperate with you in all the things you want to do in the future and that you would use it for your glory and use us for your glory this week, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. You're dismissed. Have a great week.